afternoon and welcome to our second online endowed chair interview in our impact and importance endowed chairs at UCR series. My name is Marie Schultz. I am the Associate Vice Chancellor for Development and a very proud UCR alumna. Today's interview is brought to you by UC Riverside's Bell Tower Society. The Bell Tower Society recognizes UCR's most loyal annual supporters, all of whom play a vital role in supporting the university's mission year after year. Many members have made annual gifts for decades and their commitment to supporting the campus is a genuine point of pride for the university. To all those members of the Bell Tower Society joining us today, thank you for your loyal support of UCR. Our interview today is with Professor of Finance, Jean Helweg. Professor Helweg is the Anderson Chair of Finance in the School of Business. Endowed chairs are one of the highest academic awards that the university can bestow on a faculty member. They are both an honor to the named holder of the appointment and also an enduring tribute to the donor who established the chair. Endowed chairs provide an ongoing source of financial support to the university and in turn for generations of faculty in support of research and discovery. A few housekeeping items for this event. You as the audience can see us, but we can't see you and you cannot see each other. If you have questions, please submit them for the Q&A by clicking the Q&A button on your screen. Questions will be answered as time permits at the end of the interview. Our interviewer today is Holly Ober, who is the Senior Public Information Officer in the University Communications Office of UC Riverside. I would like to acknowledge and thank Eric Anderson and the Anderson family for their generosity in creating the Anderson Chair of Finance. A. Gary Anderson was a 24-year veteran of the mortgage banking and real estate industries. He purchased Director's Mortgage in 1976 when it had four branches. By 1991, it was the nation's 15th largest residential lender with $3.8 billion in loans. In 1994, the A. Gary Anderson Family Foundation donated an initial $5 million to UCR to name the A. Gary Anderson Graduate School of Management. Since then, the foundation has established three presidential endowed chairs in business administration and a fourth chair in finance. UCR is grateful that Gary's children, Eric and Aaron, have continued his legacy of giving back to the community. Eric, who is with us tonight, serves as the treasurer of the UCR Foundation Board of Trustees and is a longtime member of the UCR School of Business Dean's Advisory Council. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jean Helwig, Professor of Finance. She is the faculty advisor to the Highlander Financial Group as well as the newly formed Highlander Student Investment Fund. Her research interests include corporate bonds, banking, financial distress, initial public offerings, and capital structure. Her research on corporate bonds has led to new insights regarding lending policies for business. Her work on credit risk provides a new lens for thinking about the appropriate response in a financial crisis, such as the current one we're experiencing. She is the author of more than 30 scholarly articles in peer-reviewed journals and currently serves as the co-editor of the Quarterly Journal of Finance, as well as the associate editor of the Journal of Financial Services Research. Thank you, Professor Helwig, for being here with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, so, so I'm uh, Holly Ober and I am uh, a public information officer. I cover the School of Business. I've had the pleasure of, of meeting Jean Helweg a couple of times. Um, I am going to ask some questions and we'll have a nice little conversation about your work and the importance of endowed chairs. So Professor Helweg, can you, what has your journey been like in getting to UCR? Well, I think I have a really unusual background for a finance professor. Um, first of all, I was an undergraduate major in linguistics, and that doesn't happen too often. Um, then I um, studied Japanese and French, and I moved to Japan for a couple of years, way many decades ago, and got interested in economics. 
Uh, so after jumping through quite a few hurdles, they uh, joined the PhD program in economics at UCLA. And that's where I met my husband. So he's from California. Um, and my first job after that was at the Fed Reserve Board in Washington, DC, which I truly hated. <laughs> it was a learning experience, but government's not for me. Um, very constraining environment. Uh, just being there nine to five, wearing a dress, uh, that was painful. So um, I was really happy to get into academia. It took me a long time to join academia, but um, uh, in 19, excuse me, no, in, <laughs> yeah, 1998, I joined Ohio State University as a finance professor, and I've been in academia since then. So I've moved around more than some other professors. I've worked at a couple of state schools, so University of South Carolina, Arizona, Ohio State, uh, and here, Penn State as well. Great. I mean, you get to benefit from all that wonderful experience. Yeah, everybody, every, every place is a little bit different. Uh, I think uh, California and the UC system are really different than South Carolina, which certainly has a very different political landscape, but also just a sense of um, newness and traditions are really different from all the schools. This is the first school I've ever worked at that doesn't have a really good football team. In fact, we don't have a football team at all. <laughs> Makes things very different. So what does the support from this endowed chair allow you to accomplish that you might not otherwise be able to do? Well, I was hired just like my colleagues to do research in finance and any kind of research is extremely time consuming. Uh, it, it takes a long time. Some of my papers have literally taken 10 years from start to finish. And every minute that you spend doing something else is time you don't spend doing research. So. An endowed chair is a way to get more time to do research. So that's very much appreciated. And I, I can't say enough good words about Eric Anderson and the Anderson family for all the support they've given to the school of business over the years. Um, and it's particularly enjoyable to have their support as an endowed chair. In your mind, what value do endowed chairs bring to universities? Well, endowed chairs help you be a stronger research university. And, you know, we're a UC, and that makes us um, part of a very strong research organization. I think we'd like to be stronger in that community. You know, we, we are often in the shadow of UCLA and Berkeley, and sometimes even Irvine. And so the more support we have for research, the more that we can bring reputation to UC Riverside. And I think not just to UC Riverside, but to Riverside and the Inland Empire, you know, there are a lot of people living here and I don't think they get the recognition for what they accomplish the way some other places do. So the more that we can contribute to the community as a university, the better off we all are. I think that's really important. Can you just please describe your research interests? Okay, well, um, I work on a lot of different things. And uh, so I'm gonna actually share my screen and give you a little bit of a sense of what I do. Just a couple of things that I find more interesting that I've, are on my, that's on my mind today. And so I've got a little bit of a PowerPoint thing going on here. So uh, I do a lot on corporate borrowing and so, you know, your typical company is going to get their money in the form of debt, not equity. We hear a lot about the stock market and about IPOs, but it is mostly about borrowing. And most companies are too small to even catch any notice from us and they're borrowing for banks, but our largest companies are in the corporate bond market. And that's where a lot of my research is. So a typical corporate bond, uh, when it's issued, is bringing in $400 million to the company, which sounds like a lot. It is a lot, and they do it often. So they might do a billion or more in a year. But despite that, people don't know much about corporate bonds. They certainly wouldn't think about buying one instead of buying a stock. They don't know what the prices are. Uh, they're just not liquid instruments. And so a lot of research, some of it being my own, says that um, the fact that they're not liquid uh, increases the interest rate. So that's one part of the interest rate, but the bigger part is that whatever company we're talking about, whether it's a corporate bond or a bank loan, they are paying more money than the US government to borrow. 
And so that extra amount that they pay is the yield spread. And that mainly covers the risk of default, but it also has liquidity in it. So let me show you a graph on my next slide here, if I'm doing this right. <laughs> Shoot. There we go. Okay, so here's a graph from FRED. FRED is the St. Louis Fed Reserves database. There's all sorts of great stuff in there. Uh, and this is for high yield bonds because there's more action in there. So um, this shows you over the last 25 years or so what a uh, uh, junk bond issuer has to pay in order to borrow in the market. And the shaded blue areas are recessions. So there's three of them in here. The one on the right kind of blends into my background, but that's today's recession, which we are officially in a recession. Uh, and so you can see the spread typically in most years is about four or five percent. So if the U.S. government and its treasury bonds is paying five percent, then a typical year, then a uh, corporate uh, high yield bond issuer would pay uh, nine or ten percent. But in 2008, uh, those companies were paying more than 20 percent. Now they didn't all pay it. Some of these are the these are the rates on bonds that are already outstanding. So, uh, if you were a company borrowing in 2008 and you had the prospect of borrowing at 20 percent, you might say, "Oh, forget it." But if you were an investor, then the average return or spread that was being paid on these was 20 percent. So it's just an unbelievable number. And I think what's one of the really interesting things is that. We're in a really terrible recession right now in the sense that all of the metrics have been busted. The records are crazy. Second quarter of this year, annualized GDP fell by 32%. That's a number you've never seen before. Uh, consumer confidence is down. Unemployment is at a record high. Right, well, it's come down a little bit since the worst part of the coronavirus, but it's really a pretty terrible time for the economy. And yet when you look at junk bond spreads, it's not really that bad. Sure, it's up a lot since February, but it's nothing like 2008. And so one of the things that I've been working on besides looking at corporate bond spreads is to try to figure out what's different about 2008. And one of the things that's really different is what did the Fed Reserve do in terms of dealing with that crisis? So I want to talk a little bit about Ben Bernanke and what he did. And he's very fond of saying that he did unique things in the subprime crisis compared to other Fed chairmen. So one thing was to lower the interest rate to zero. It had been lowered before in previous recessions, but this time it was actually at zero. And he said, not only is it bringing it to zero, but he's going to leave it there for a long time. So that's certainly unusual. And they also used the Fed Reserve's money printing abilities to buy treasury bonds with the idea that that would bring down interest rates. And then also lent directly to a number of companies. Now, the Fed Reserve is often, like every other central bank, considered the lender of last resort. So it's supposed to help out in a crisis. And his policy, just like people before him, was to say, in a crisis, we're going to lend a lot, but we're not going to make it super cheap. So this is Walter Badgett's advice from the 1800s before there was a central bank say lend freely at a penalty rate. And the idea is that a good company, when they have no other place to borrow, would borrow from the central bank, but a bad company would not be, would not have the incentive to do it in other time periods. And so to add to that, then Bernanke um, expanded the discount window facility to investment banks. So companies like Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers and JP Morgan Chase, uh, and not just to banks, and also created these auctions to uh, get money out to these financial companies. So the, the nicknames for them are the acronyms or the TAF and the TSLF. And then even though it's a fiscal policy, not a monetary policy, um, Bernanke was very, very much involved in TARP, which was supposed to be a way to purchase troubled assets, right? That's what the TA stands for, a troubled asset relief uh, program, but actually it just turned into a way to give money to banks for their capital. So uh, one of the papers that I've worked on um, showed, well, what actually happened with this emergency lending facility. So this is a paper with uh, Nikki Boyson and Jan Yindra. And um, so this is just the discount window part of it, but it's uh, kind of a similar story for the rest of it. So one thing is that you can see, this is a graph that shows 
the borrowing from August of 2007 until June of 2009. So it's essentially the last recession. And you can see until Bear Stearns in March of 2008, nobody was borrowing anything because it wasn't really that bad of a crisis. And it's a penalty rate, so they wouldn't want to borrow unless things were awful. And then after Bear Stearns, clearly the debt markets were more disturbed than usual. It's not normal. And so there's a jump up, but it's a very small jump up because it's not even close to 25 billion. The companies that could borrow from the discount window, commercial banks, so we can split them into big commercial banks and small ones and really big ones called money center banks, um, savings and loans or credit unions. Those companies altogether, they have trillions of dollars in assets and they're borrowing not even 25 billion. So obviously nobody was too keen to borrow from the discount window. And then when Lehman got into trouble in September of 2008. Then there's a big jump up. But at that point, we're still not even at 125 billion. Trillions of dollars are being supported by these companies, but not through the Fed Reserve. So it's just a very unpopular borrowing program. So the other thing about this graph, and I can say my co-author Jan Hendra is much better with the colors than I am. So he's the one who made this thing so much in red, but who, who borrowed, who are the red guys in here? They are foreign banks. And so what a shocking thing is that hardly anybody borrowed from a central bank in a time period when Bernanke said debt markets were frozen. But when you say who did borrow, there are banks from other countries. And not only that, the red, there's two shades of red. There's a bright red and a darker red. The bright red are banks from other countries that were already in financial trouble and had gotten help from their own countries, their own central banks, their own governments. They were already bailed out. They somehow had been nationalized. And somehow our central bank was lending to them. And you can see the foreign banks got the majority of the money that was lent through the Fed Reserve. Mm -hmm. So a very strange way of dealing with a crisis. And certainly not what you'd expect to have happen. Uh, and so that's some of the stuff that I work on in terms of research. I think I might be going on too long here. So let me stop sharing and come back to Holly here. Well, can you talk about your research, ex your experience and research as it relates to the current bad economic times? I think you were basically, this is asking you to expand, I think, on what you were just talking about. It sounds like you worked a lot. Well, so I, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that Ben Bernanke is not my favorite Fed governor. Uh, you know, when he was appointed, he was the first uh, truly academic uh, to be appointed to its Fed chair. And so it seemed like, well, this would be great because he really brings some understanding of the research to the, to the area. Uh, and he certainly has a, a very good understanding of the research. But I think um, it, there's a, an element of practicality in being a Fed chairman as well. And I don't think that um, he's the most practical practical person out there. So, but also he tried a bunch of new things. And when you try new things, how do you know if they've worked or not? So he would claim that they work great. But I think that a lot of his strategy was to get the TARP money for the economy. And in doing so, he intentionally scared people. And you can see that in the graph that I showed that the average spread on junk bonds went to 20%. And so from my perspective, that alone would say he failed as a Fed chairman in a crisis because it's not helpful to scare people in order to then help them. Consumer confidence, investor confidence is very important. And I think Jay Powell's done a really good job of providing confidence in this situation. And so you know, that probably has a lot to do with why the spread on junk bonds did not hit 20% this time around. And um, Therefore, it'll be a little bit easier for companies to get through this. I mean, it's, there's just so much the Fed can do, right? We know that if, if all the businesses are shut down, then lowering interest rates is just going to have a limited uh, amount of effect on things. But at least he's not out there saying this is the worst recession since the Great Depression, debt markets are frozen, even good companies cannot borrow. And Bernanke said those things over and over again to the effect that People were frightened of companies that were probably pretty decent. Uh, so I think that's, that's an important part of um, the kind of research that I do. And um, 
I think it has a lot to say about what we can do going forward in terms of policy. I can keep talking about that. <laughs> and that's at least the next question, how buys the Fed chair to help improve the economy? Yeah, well, this is certainly a different time, right? Um, I tell my students when I teach fixed income that most of our recessions were caused by the Fed Reserve. And they never own up to that, but they do. And the reason why is that usually they increase interest rates before a recession occurs. They're trying to fend off inflation. And in the process of doing that, they just hit the brakes for too long, right? You can think of it as the Fed is driving a vehicle and they hit the gas and try to get it going faster when we're in a recession and they hit the brakes when they're worried about inflation. But inevitably, they just don't take their foot off the brake fast enough. But this one, this is not their fault. This recession is truly out of the blue. We've got this virus and we don't seem to have another way to fight it except to shut down and keep people from going to work. Uh, and it's really a very tough thing for smaller businesses and you know, individuals and not so much for the big companies that issue corporate bonds. So it's actually been pretty decent time for the corporate bond market because not only has the Fed brought their benchmark rate down, which is the Fed funds rate, but they brought it down and made it really clear they're going to leave it there for a long time. And so the 10-year treasury is below 1%, which is first time ever. If the 10-year treasury is less than 1%, that means that the stronger companies are going to be paying very little money to borrow. So it's, it's a decent time for a, a large number of big companies. And unfortunately, that money doesn't get to little people so much. Right? The Fed has never had a policy that's really helped small companies. They have something called the Main, Main Street Lending Program this year which is the first time they've ever done that. And the last time I heard, which I think is about a month ago, they didn't have anybody borrowing from it yet. So um, they're much better at helping a company like Boeing or Johnson & Johnson than some little company that we've never heard of. But that's, there's certain industries that I think are going to really need bailing out from this, like restaurants and hotels and a lot of retailers are going out, I wonder, you know, are, are there industry bailouts in the works, do you think? And if so, do you think industry bailouts work? Well, so this is why Badgett in the 1800s said to lend at a penalty rate, right? When you bail out somebody, and, and some people really hate that word bailout, but when you give money to a company in a crisis to help them get through it, you're basically saying you deserve to be in business and we want to make sure that you have the the wherewithal to get through it. Well, who decides that a company deserves to be in business? Well, in the subprime crisis, literally it was Ben Bernanke, right? He said, Bear Stearns deserved it, Lehman didn't. Who is he to decide that? I mean, it is kind of playing God, right? So, but the alternative is to let the market decide who deserves to get more money, who doesn't. And I've done a fair amount of research on bankruptcy and in, you know, in for non-financial companies, when they go bankrupt, they do get a second chance, at least in the United States, not in so much in other countries, but they do get a second chance and the money that they get to continue on comes from their creditors. So for example, in the early 1990s, Macy's went through bankruptcy, right? Macy's been around a long time, may not make it through this crisis, it's a tough time for retail, but you know they got the money to continue on by letting their bondholders become their future equity holders and the equity holders were wiped out. But when you do a bailout, you say, no, the equity holders don't get wiped out. You get to continue on. Uh, and there's a lot to complain about in that process. And I think, you know, on the slide that I showed you with the amount of borrowing from the Fed by foreign banks, what strikes me about it as being terribly wrong is that it's so unfair. Why should, the US government through the Fed Reserve help out competitors to our banks. We had a lot of bank failures during that time period. So there are a lot of small banks out there that went out of business and maybe they could have stayed in business if they were handed money by the Fed Reserve or even if they weren't handed money, if the Fed Reserve didn't give money to some failed banks 
over in Belgium. So um, the bailouts always have the problem that people think they may not be fair. And a lot of these, a lot of people these days complain about capitalism not being fair because capitalism can leave a lot of people behind, especially right now in this crisis. But the, the really good thing about capitalism is that it rewards people for being productive and efficient and for putting resources to good use. And bailouts kind of do the opposite of that. If you're a terrible bank manager, you get a bailout from the Fed through the discount window basically saying, you're a terrible bank manager, but we want you to keep making loans and doing whatever you're doing that ran your bank into the ground. And how can that be a good thing for society? What do you consider most important about your research? Well, so as a finance professor, we tend to work on one of two topics. We either do asset pricing and investments, or we do corporate finance. And I do a little bit of both. Okay. So on the investment side, people look at stocks and bonds. On the financing side, they look more at how companies are run. And so I've worked on both areas, but I'd say mostly what I do is to try to figure out what is the right price and the right way for companies to get money to expand. And of course, we all want them to expand because when companies expand, they create wealth for everybody in the country, especially all of us who have 401k investments. But probably more importantly, they create jobs and they create good jobs. So um, I think that's probably the most important thing that I do with my research. I know it's pretty indirect. It's not like every company out there is reading everything I write, <laughs> but that's the process with the universities. You work on stuff, you get it out there in the profession and it slowly makes itself into the real world. And of course, you always have a chance to talk about it in your classes, right? So, um, you know, we teach a lot of um, graduate students from China in the School of Business. And so sometimes when we talk about, uh, when I lecture on corporate finance, I talk about some of these topics, they'll give me examples of things that go on in China and you know, China is certainly a country to be admired in how much it has grown economically in the last couple decades. But in terms of efficiency, my goodness, I'm like, <laughs> there are so many decisions that are made by the government. So one of my students said, when a company goes bankrupt in China, the government steps in and says, well, this other company should then buy it. It's like, that's the norm. We do that in a crisis. That's just like Bear Stearns. <laughs> that's not Lehman Brothers, but it could have been Lehman Brothers. But that is not the norm in the U.S. Uh, in the U.S., we let the market decide where the resources should go. Can you describe your involvement with the Highlander Financial Group as well as the Highlander Student Investment Fund? Sure, I would love to talk about that. Um, you know, first I want to say that not very many endowed professors are the advisor to a club. Uh, and this is something that is really true to my heart that I like to push a lot at UC Riverside. So I'm going to share my screen again to show you just a, a little bit of information in case we have some students who are thinking about joining our group. I'm having a hard time get to the next slide. There we go. Okay. So uh, the Highlander Financial Group is a club and anybody on campus can come to it. Graduate student, undergraduate, you can have any kind of background in it. Uh, and the club is for picking stocks. And since, since I've been involved in it for the last four years, we always meet on uh, Monday nights at 7 p.m. in the hub. And it's been unfortunate that we're remote. So the last quarter we were all on Zoom meetings and we'll be on Zoom again uh, in the fall. And then uh, we have another group that's part of HFG. It's the Highlander Student Investment Fund. And this is a new group, uh, thanks to a donation that we got last spring. Um, the students in HFG who have the right training are able to manage a real money portfolio. So we had $190,000 given to us and we started investing it on October 1st of last year. Uh, and I looked earlier today and we're up to 213,000, so a 12 and a half percent return, which is pretty darn good, um, especially that the portfolio that um, we invest has to have at least 20% bonds. I say it's a stock picking club and most of the students hate the fixed income stuff, 
I try to get students enthusiastic about fixed income because fixed income are bonds and that's what I work on. But usually they just want to pick stocks. Um, and so most of the money is in individual stocks and exchange traded funds. And then to be somebody who decides how to manage the $200,000, um, you have to be a finance student and you have to have taken a certain number of classes. And then you have to really spend some serious amount of time working on the valuation on it and trying to pick a stock, trying to find one that's going to be a winner. So we invested starting October 1st of last year, and we had a lot of money in the stock market, you know, most of it. And then when the virus hit, we lost a bunch, just like everybody else. Uh, we had some terrible investments. Our, our worst one was Southwest Airlines, the ticker love. We lost, I want to say 45, almost 50% on that. Um, but other stuff um, came back and then some of the stay at home economy stocks like PayPal did great. I think, um, you know, we sold some stocks before the summer started just to be a little bit more conservative. So I want to say on PayPal, I think we made about 50% on that. Um, so we're up overall uh, it's been a wild ride. It's a heck of a way to start a fund. You know, this, we haven't even been in it for a year and already we went through this year, uh, but it's been a wonderful learning experience for the students. Uh, and we hope to get you know, more students involved in HFG, more students studying finance. Um, and I'm really looking forward to advising the team next year as they pick the investments for the student managed fund. So I'll stop sharing now and uh, come back to, to you. Kind of a trial by fire for these students learning that you started getting their um, in, start in the investing world in this particular market. <laughs> yeah, well, we had been running a paper portfolio so, for HFG head. So a lot of the students were pretty familiar with things, but it's different when it's actual money there. You, you feel a lot more nervous about losing it. Right. Um, and um, it is, uh, you know, when you have a loser stock, it's like, well, you know, I feel bad about it, but it could come back. And so on the paper portfolio, I think a little bit more willing to hold on to it. But when it's real money and, you, and you've lost a bunch, it's like, well, when are you going to get rid of this thing? So it is a team effort. It, you know, we don't need to have unanimous decisions on which investments to make, but it does have to be the majority. And so you've got to convince other people that this is a good stock to buy or that this is the time to get out of it. Uh, and they don't always agree on that stuff. So, so it's, been, it's been a good experience. I think it's um, really a, a, a great way for undergraduates, especially to be engaged with the finance group. You know, it's, we're not a large university, but it is easy to sort of get mm, lost in the shuffle and have a lot of distance between you and your professor, especially you know, it's only 10 minutes between classes and a lot of the students are trying to get their classes done on one day so that they don't have to commute so much and fight with the parking. Um, so, you know, when you get to talk to your professor in just sort of a, a chatty kind of way, well, if you've got another class, you're not hanging around after class. And sometimes I've got another class. I try to set up my schedule so that I don't have to rush off to another class. But uh, so the, the Monday nights are a great way to talk to students about investing but about school in general and job hunts and you know that's another big part of it is a lot of the students would love to have a career where they get to pick stocks and to manage money and so this is a, a great introduction to it. it's also a great resume builder and we've had some success with students getting those kinds of jobs so hope to get more people in it okay. what are your future plans for research moving into being an endowed chair well, research is very slow. So probably my immediate goal is to finish up papers I've been working on for a long time. So I'll say one of the papers that I'm working on is on the TARP program. And, um, you know, even though that happened a while ago and it doesn't look like we're doing that again, it could happen again. And um, so I'm working with a professor in Australia and we are looking at conference called transcripts. So uh, a lot of the larger banks will hold a quarterly conference call to discuss their earnings. And so we're looking at the conference calls that they held in fall of 2008 and January, um, yeah, January 2009, where they talk about the TARP money and what they plan to do with it. And of course, the goal was to get them to lend it. 
and none of them will say, no, we're not going to lend it. But a lot of them explain in a fair amount of detail why lending wasn't going to happen. Um, sometimes there wasn't much demand for loans. Uh, other times they just had so little capital themselves, they needed to shrink in order to uh, meet the guidelines um, for bank regulation. So I'll be working on that and still working on um, credit risk and corporate bonds. Um, and of course, you know, with the coronavirus, there's uh, another crisis to be working on. It does seem like these crises are coming too close together. Um, you know, in the US, we, I don't think we've ever got a decade without some horrible recession or a recession. Uh, Australia managed to go something like 25 years without having a recession, but of course now, you know, that has ended. Um, so it does seem like there's a lot of work to be done on that sort of topic and less on IPOs and <laughs> uh, growth and positive things. But um, yeah, I, I might do some more work on IPOs again as well. All right, I think we have some questions. Okay. Let me find them here. Okay. First, we have a, someone asking, is there, there is a significant disconnect between what we see on Wall Street and Main Street. Has it always been so to the current degree? If not, why is it different now? Yes, there's really a very clear disconnect now. Has it always been that way? That's a good question. I think it's research has shown that uh, larger companies always have more choices than smaller companies, right? I mean, we have a, a concept in corporate finance called financial constraints. It's very hard to measure that and maybe not even clear that it exists because in the US, it is pretty easy in most times to get financing. Um, so, but, you know, if you're a small company that is just getting going, where do you get the money to do anything? Um, some research has shown that a lot of that money comes from the equity in your house. Okay. So most, believe it or not, most small companies are started by older people because they have some experience. They have an idea of what to sell. And we always see, we always hear about these young people who started something and Steve Jobs has started in his garage. And there is a lot of that stuff, but the majority of companies are by older people who have a better sense of what they're investing in. And they typically are, taken out a mortgage on their house and taking that money and putting it into a business. I think a scarier thing is some people are taking out their retirement money and putting it into business. And so, I don't know if that's such a great idea, but um, that does happen in the US. Um, so if you don't have access to financing in a downturn, it's going to be tougher. And so definitely in recessions, smaller companies are going to have the hardest time. Whereas the larger companies could also, I mean, the last recession, the subprime crisis was a large company story. I mean, we saw Bear Stearns, we saw Merrill Lynch, we saw all these very large companies get into trouble, um, but it wasn't good for the small companies either. So I think compared to that time, this one seems really strange, but the subprime crisis I think was unusual in that so many large well-known companies got into trouble. In previous recessions, it is much more smaller companies that have a difficult time getting financing. So I think another element too is that um, this one, it's so much about, do you have a business that involves physical contact or not, right? So all these software companies that are doing fine, Zoom, for example, um, you know, they're actually probably has, they have more business than they had before the crisis. So um, there'll definitely be a, a very large disconnect between the large companies and the small companies. Do you think they will bail out the, this is another audience question. Do you think they will bail out the large airlines because they are too big to fail, similar as the large banks in the Great Recession? So as I said, our worst investment in the um, Highlander Student Investment Fund was Southwest Airlines. And we held on to it as long as we did because uh, the team was thinking there'd be a bailout. Um, and after a while, we said, well, maybe there will be a bailout, but there's so many other better investments to make. So from the perspective of picking a stock, I wouldn't count on that bailout. I think it's already been a long time and it hasn't happened yet. And we have seen airlines go bankrupt in the past, 
Uh, they don't grow their business, but their shareholders lose a lot of money. I, I just don't see people having the stomach for it. People don't like bailouts to begin with. And even though everybody has a lot of sympathy for anyone who works for an airline, they don't necessarily want to give money to them. Why give money to them as opposed to a waitress or a hairdresser? So um, I, don't, I don't think people are going to go for that. Um, so, but if it does happen, I think it'll be a while and I wouldn't invest in their stock. Interesting. Okay, next audience question. Would bailing out higher education be fair? Do you think it will happen? Bailing out higher education. Hmm, I don't know. Um, in some sense, uh, higher education is always getting a bailout. Um, we get a lot of money from the state of California. Uh, we also get a lot of money from our donors. So, um, but, so I'm not even sure the idea of a bailout for higher education makes sense. But, um, and probably the biggest um, subsidy to higher education has been the very generous student loan terms. You know, I paid, what, paid my way through college many decades ago, and I can't even remember the numbers, it was such a long time ago, but I think tuition back then was like 6,000 a year, and you could only borrow 2,500. So you, you just couldn't pay for all of your education through a student loan, and these days you can. I mean, the Wall Street Journal had an article about a dentist who had borrowed $600,000 to go through dental school. That's not something that you could have done back when I was uh, at an age when I might have thought about dental school. So we, we've had this very long history of helping out the, the universities, and yet it's not enough because universities are very, very expensive to run. Research is very expensive. Um, so would it be fair to do that, to keep doing, to do more of it? You know, I don't think too many people are more in favor of education than I am, but I, I do think maybe it's time to put some pressure on the universities to live within their means. It's a frightening thing to say. <laughs> it's being recorded too. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, well, let's see. We have another question. As someone who has worked at the Federal Reserve, you might have an opinion on whether the Federal Reserve is doing everything it can to help the economy recover during this current terrible financial crisis. What, in your opinion, should the Federal Reserve be doing? So, actually, I, kind of sh I should have said this when I was talking about my research on this. So, one of the reasons why the Federal Reserve lends at a penalty rate, and they still do this, okay, it's not, a terrible, like large penalty. But one of the reasons why they lend at a penalty rate is that they want to get paid back. Okay. It's a loan. It's not an equity investment. They are required by law to only make loans. Sometimes I think they sort of fudge the definition of a loan, but they're just not in the business of picking stocks. Okay. So when they make a, a loan to the discount window or any other facility, they want to get paid back. And the unfortunate thing is that if they really did a lot to help out Main Street and small businesses, they wouldn't get paid back all the time. I mean, it, it's just too much of a crisis. And so, um, you know, I posted on LinkedIn a while ago that one of the things they could do is to give extremely long-term loans to Square, which has almost only small businesses as their customers and then have Square give that money to their customers. And if it turns out they have a bunch of losses on it, then so be it. But they're not gonna do that because they don't wanna lose the money. They're not an investor in the US economy the way you and I could be. They're making loans and they wanna get paid back. And if they don't get paid back, it's gonna be very tough politically, but also they, um, they couldn't do that for very long. They're just not set up to do that. So, so there's, a, there's an argument to say, well, this is when it's time for fiscal policy. This is when it's time for the US government to go in and give money to small businesses. And that's what they have been doing, right? I mean, people on unemployment were getting an extra 
$600. And so um, they did a lot. The question is, is that enough? So it's not really, it's not really up to the Fed Reserve. The Fed Reserve has lowered rates to zero. They're going to keep them there at zero. You can't get any lower interest rates. But what they always say about the Fed is that it's pushing on a string. Right? You know, you can, if you push on a string, you can get it to move along, but it's not a very effective way to make things happen. And so by lowering interest rates, they're making it easier for companies to borrow at a cheap rate but it's going to be those very large companies that are not going to go bankrupt that everybody believes in. And those guys can borrow at a great rate right now. But, you know, mom and pop businesses, especially in the ones that are hit hard by physical presence, you know, hairdressers and restaurants, uh, it would be very difficult for them to borrow at a rate that would make any sense for them. So, so yeah, it's it's not up to the Fed anymore. It's up to the federal government, state governments to the extent they can. And for people to get very, very creative about running their business, despite the fact that they really shouldn't be in physical contact with anybody. Okay, um, um, next question, next audience question. Do you believe in the theory of too big to fail? Do you think the government should break up companies that have been deemed too big to fail? When talking about too big to fail, they're talking about banks. Um, I think the only really big company that's not a bank that they bailed out was GM in 2008. So, um, so when we're talking about banking, is it good to have very large banks? And especially in a bad time, is it good to keep them in business? And I think the answer is clearly no. It's not obvious that having a very large bank is more effective for the economy than having a bunch of small banks. Uh, people used to complain about small banks being very inefficient, but that's probably before the Wells Fargo scandal, where now you can see they don't even know what their own employees are doing, opening accounts as a way to improve their bonuses without the customers even agreeing to having those accounts. So um, there's definitely a lot of problems with big banks. But I think more importantly, in terms of fairness and efficiency, when a big bank screws up and they need a bailout, they should just be sold off. And there are a lot of issues with selling them off, the way they sold off Bear Stearns, the way they tried to sell off Lehman, that's not an efficient way to do things. So I would suggest that they break them up into a bunch of small pieces and sell off the pieces um, to a bunch of different um, potential investors. So, I mean, one problem with the Fed Reserve in the last crisis, when they orchestrated a bailout, what they would do is they would have what they deemed a healthy bank by a failed bank. So JP Morgan Chase bought Bear Stearns. So there's always the issue of the price, which they can never get right. But there's also the problem that in the end, now you have a bigger bank. And if that bank does get into trouble later, you just have more problems. And that's definitely what happened in Japan and their financial crisis in the late 80s and early 1990s is they didn't have a lot of small banks to begin with. When they got all got into trouble, they put them together into some very giant banks that were essentially zombie banks for a decade. And that's really bad for the economy, as well as for the idea of fairness, right? We have some really good banks in this country that didn't screw up before the subprime crisis. And they didn't get the benefit of buying Bear Stearns. So, for example, PNC, bb and I mean, I'm not saying they're the best banks out there. I'm just saying that they're pretty decent sized banks that did a pretty good job, but they were not in the club. They were not anointed as the buyer of the bad banks. And so that's another element of bailouts that um, I think is just bad for the long run and a reason to try to have at least medium-sized banks, if not small banks. Interesting. Um, the next audience question is, what percentage of shareholders at risk are actually pension funds like IRAs, 401ks, 403bs? So most stocks are owned by institutions and the institutions are mostly mutual funds. So 401ks are run by mutual funds. Uh, so mutual funds have a very large fraction of stocks. Um, 
Most pensions these days are not defined benefit. So we do have some in California, CalSTRS and CalPERS, but um, so Holly, you and I have a defined benefit pension, right? We're, we're counting on the investment portion of the state of California to run it properly, but that's not the norm these days. Uh, and so, you know, most of the stock market is owned by institutions who are managing money for people's 401ks and 403bs and other things. Um, are they at risk? Well, yes, it's risky money, right? If you didn't want to take a risk, you'd put it into a bond or a bank account. Um, so they're risky instruments by, by their nature. And are they riskier now at this point in the stock market than they were before? Yeah, we bounced back awfully quickly on this one. I mean, this is way better than March 2009. March 2009 was truly awful time period. Um, and, you know, at the time, my sister took her money out of the stock market. She said she couldn't sleep at night. And I said, Anne, if you're taking money out of the stock market, you're betting against the United States. And I would not bet against the United States. We have a really strong economy, very resilient. And I think, you know, it's, it may not be great at any particular moment, but it'll bounce back um, because we do have a huge emphasis on efficiency and a good use of our resources. So yeah, it's all risky, but um, on average, it works out pretty well. Which is why we're always really high fraction of equity in the Highlander Student Investment Fund, because it's not just me, the students believe it even more than I do. They're really bullish on the American economy. I think we have time for one last question. So here we have one. Is there anything the banking and finance industry can do to address income inequality? Mm. Well, income inequality certainly is a big issue these days. And there's a couple of different perspectives on it. The worst kind of income inequality is when you have a bunch of really poor people and a few really wealthy people. And the U.S. historically has not been a country that has such an extreme case like that. I think historically Mexico has had more of that. Um, probably China has, has more. I don't know every country, but the U.S. is not particularly bad on that. But we definitely have um, some very wealthy people who have done really well by creating very strong companies. I don't know why we would want to get rid of those people by taking their wealth away or reducing the incentive to create such companies. So when we talk about income inequality, I think the most important thing is how bad off are the people at the bottom? And they have improved, or at least they were improving until this coronavirus. So even though income inequality has been increasing, it has not been because people at the bottom have been falling further behind. It is mostly a jealousy story. Everybody would like to be Bill Gates. So I don't, I don't even think it's much of a problem to work on, but I do think it's important to get the people at the bottom higher up. And that frankly is the story of the Inland Empire. People who live in the Inland Empire on average are doing worse than people who live in Orange County or LA. So how do we get them to be better off? The answer is to come to UC Riverside and study finance. Right, and on, on that note, I think we're, we're pretty much at the end of our conversation here. I'd like to thank you for joining us today and look forward to the next time we get a chance to chat. Thanks very much. And I'd like to thank the Anderson family again, and particularly Eric Anderson for the support of UC Riverside and the School of Business. I'm really very grateful to all of that. Thanks. Thank you so much, Holly and Professor Helwig. And thank you to everyone who joined us this evening. I would like to invite you all to attend the next endowed chair interview on September 17th with Ziyun Qian, Associate Professor of Computer Science and Engineering in the Bournes College of Engineering. This concludes our webinar. Have a good evening. <laughs>